Uh, dear Heavenly Father, as I share my testimony tonight, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross, that the things that I do and say and share this evening would bring honor and glory to your name. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as I stand here in front of you guys tonight, uh, in front of these two charts, um, I want to explain why I'm here and why I have these two charts behind me. I um, have been a Seventh-day Adventist for going on 22 years. And I um, came into Adventism through a Daniel and Revelation seminar. And many of the prophecies that are on these charts convicted me that the Seventh-day Adventist Church had the truth for this time. And after I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I sort of, uh, I was very excited and I was excited to uh, share these truths with my friends and family and everybody that I could come in contact with 22 years ago. But as time went along, I sort of drifted into Laodiceanism. I became proverbial, uh, proverbially asleep. And um, even though I still believed, I wasn't as uh, fervent as I once was. And so um, things of the world started creeping back into my life. Uh, watching television, uh, worldly entertainment, uh, being involved with uh, going to sporting events, and all these things had crept back into my life. Well, in 2008, um, I had an, I experienced a financial crisis. We were doing very well financially at the time, and there was a downturn in the economy, and this cost us major financial crisis in our lives. And it was at this time that I believe that the Lord was trying to talk to me, trying to direct me back into the right path. And it took some time. But as things continued to get worse for us financially, it drove me to my knees to pray and ask for God's guidance. And one thing after another my wife and I and family started laying things down. We got rid of the TVs. We disconnected the cable. We stopped uh, being involved in various kinds of worldly entertainment. And as we took these steps, more and more the Lord started opening up our mind. And um, finally, studying God's Word, we saw that we were really in the last days. And we accepted what, what's known as the country living uh, uh, message. That the Lord, uh, through Ellen White, and I believe can be easily shown through the Bible, that God desires His people to be out of the cities. And that um, we can raise our families there, in a safer area without the din and noise of confusion that city life brings. And so my wife and I were convicted that we needed to sort of move into the country. So we moved out a little ways. And uh, the Lord, we, we believed that He wanted us out further, and we were looking for a place to live in the country. We went all over the East Coast. We went down into the South. We went as far as Texas, and we didn't feel like the Lord was giving us any providential leanings. So we, we, we came back home. Uh, at the time, we were living in Virginia. And um, one particular day, a friend of mine called me up, and he said, Hey, uh, uh, I know you guys are looking to live in the country. Have you ever thought about going to Idaho? And I said, Idaho? No, I've never thought about going to Idaho. 
I, I, I'm not interested in going to Idaho. That's on the other side of the country from where we are. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking about West Virginia, Tennessee, uh, but the Lord is not convicting us that we should go to any of those places. Uh, but, you know, I, thanks for the information on Idaho. And then it wasn't more than a day later, I believe, that I got another phone call. And this time it was from another person. And in the conversation, he goes, you know, I was thinking, you're thinking about wanting to move to the country. Have you ever thought about moving to Idaho? And I said, you know, you're the second person in as many days to tell me, you know, check out Idaho. What, what's all this Idaho stuff? Then, I, I, I can't remember if it was that day or if it was the day after, I got a call from an ex-pastor of mine, and we got to talking, and he knew that I was into the country living message, and he said, hey, have you ever thought about Idaho? Now, now this is three people, right? Well, I had to go on a business trip, and... Um, I had started getting back into vegetarianism, and I needed to go from Winchester, Virginia, to the outskirts of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and on the way, there was a truck stop that I would stop at that had a salad bar. So I went to this truck stop uh, this, this week after these events, Idaho, 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 and uh, I have the type of personality where when I go anywhere, a restaurant, the grocery store, wherever it is, I like to engage people in conversation. So there was a, a two individuals at the truck stop, two truckers that were talking, and one of the truckers was telling the other trucker that he was going to be retiring soon, and him and his wife were thinking about moving to Colorado. And the trucker said, well, you know, People that are thinking of moving to Colorado, they think they want to move to Colorado, but they really want to move to Idaho. <laughs> and the guy said, well, where do you live? He goes, I live in Idaho. <laughs> he said, you really should check out Idaho. So that's when I chimed into the conversation. And then the trucker started telling me about Idaho, and we got into this big conversation. So now there are four individuals that are instructing me Idaho, right? So I uh, go on my merry way and I arrive at my destination in the evening. I check into my hotel and I'm getting into a conversation with the clerk, the desk clerk at the hotel, the night manager, um, a young lady. And uh, we get into this conversation and I asked her how she liked this area that she was, that, that, I, that I had just traveled to. And she goes, well, uh, it's okay. It's not for me. Um, my husband is going to a college course out here. It's the only place in the whole country that offers this particular course that he needed. And as soon as he's done, we're going back home. And I said, well, where is home? And she goes, Idaho. <laughs> I'm not even sure I have ever even met anybody from Idaho before. <laughs> right? So... In a week span, five different individuals are telling me that I should go to Idaho. Amen. Now, nobody's ever told me that in my life, not even one time, let alone five times in a week. By five different individuals separated from both time and space. Amen? Amen. So now at this time, what do I do with the information? I get back home from my trip and I tell my wife the story, this, 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 this. And my wife is like, well, what do you think? I said, well, I think it's God's providential leading. We've been asking where we should go, where, what, what we should do, and where the Lord wants us. You know, we don't want to run behind the Lord or ahead of the Lord, but in lockstep with the Lord. Amen? Amen. So my wife and I decided that we were going to come to Idaho, that we were going to mark out 30 days and that we were going to come to Idaho and see what the Lord had in store for us here. And um, if nothing happened, if the Lord wasn't leading, then at least we 
you know, we followed what we believe was his uh, divine guidance that, that he was communicating to us that we needed to do this thing. So we packed up our vehicle, loaded the kids in the car, uh, and off on this mission to come to Idaho. Now we did a little research and um, I have, uh, I like the water and we noticed that in northern Idaho there was a large lake um, called uh, in Sandpoint, Lake Pondere. And so I said, well you know what, uh, let's just beeline it to that place. Let's just beeline it to Sandpoint, Idaho. So we drove here, stopped at some tourist destinations along the way like Mount Rushmore and uh, South Dakota and other places like that and we got out here and uh, we arrived uh, over the border from Montana on Interstate 90 on the 4th of July and in fact as we were driving on Interstate 90 coming into Idaho we passed this place known as 4th of July Pass and I told my wife I said isn't it ironic that it is 4th of July and we're coming on 4th of July Pass. So we beelined it to, uh, Idaho, uh, to Sandpoint, Idaho on the 4th of July and um, when we arrived we checked into a hotel room and I told my wife, I said, well you know the kids have been in the car for multiple days and they've been good and they haven't been complaining and and they, we should reward them by taking them to go see the fireworks. It is 4th of July. And I said to my wife, surely there must be a 4th of July a fireworks display in this town. And I said, I, and I bet it is down at the beach uh, at Sandpoint on the lake. And so we unloaded the stuff out of the car as quickly as we possibly could and, uh, you know, freshened ourselves up after being in the car another day and beelined it downtown Sandpoint. And when we got down there, we couldn't find a place to park anywhere. And you know the old thing, you, you know, you, you, you try the first block and then there's nothing and then you go to the next block and there's nothing and then the next block and next block and finally you're like six blocks away and then you make the decision, well, is there even enough time to make it down there before the fireworks start? So we parked the car, I don't know, six or seven blocks away and walked in and um, we're making our way through the sea of humanity uh, trying to find a little perch uh, to view the fireworks from but everywhere, there's just people everywhere. And uh, I, as I'm navigating through the crowd, I've got my two children in tow and my wife and... Um, the next thing I know, I think I found a place that where I want to sit and um, I turn around to talk to my wife and my two sons are there and I said, well, where's your mom? And they said, well, uh, she is talking to some lady back there. And I said, well, why didn't you tell me? And they said, I don't know, we're just following you. <laughs> so we made our way back to where my wife was and as my wife had uh, been walking through the crowd uh, following after me and I'm like a madman trying to find a little place to sit because surely the fireworks display is going to start soon. Uh, as my wife was going through the crowd a hand came from nowhere almost with a little DVD and uh, my wife uh, as many times as it will be in these great uh, meetings that people have, fireworks and different things like that. People are always trying to give away different things and sell different things. And so as this hand reached out with this uh, CD actually, a plastic CD, my wife took the, uh, the CD from this hand and, and took a couple steps and she looked at the CD and it said on the CD, the Sabbath. And so being a Seventh-day Adventist, she turned around and asked the lady that gave it to her, what religion are you? And the lady said to her, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And so here it is, we're in Sandpoint, Idaho, 
And the, first, the very first people that we meet are Seventh-day Adventists. Amen? So the Lord has been telling us that we need to go to Idaho, and we think that we're going to Idaho because we believe in country living, and we believe that the Lord is leading us here specifically because this is where He wants us to live. And so we're going by the light that we have. And now my wife has just met an individual that hands her a CD on the Sabbath. So this couple invite us to join them on their blanket, which was amazing because they had this space, right? And we're looking for a space, and they've got more space than they need. So they invite us to come and sit on the blanket with them. And so uh, we start fellowshipping together, exchanging information, uh, telling them about, uh, you know, where we're from and where they're from. And, and uh, as, as we start talking, uh, and I at this time had believed that I knew a little bit about Bible prophecy and a little bit about Adventism, uh, this gentleman asked me a question and it takes me aback. And it, it really kind of shook me up. Now, when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, the evangelist that gave me Bible studies went over the fact that in the Bible, the Bible teaches that we need a second witness for everything that we believe. Amen? Amen. That in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let all things be established. And we're told that line upon line, text upon text. And so when I came into the church, this is what I was taught, that we, there were principles of Bible interpretation, that the Bible is of what? No private interpretation. Amen? And that we must understand the Word of God by going to and fro, back and forth, line upon line, here a little and there a little. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let all things be established. And so this was ingrained in me from the very early days of becoming a Seventh-day Adventist. I believe this with all my, my strength. And so when this gentleman asks me this question, he says to me, let me ask you a question. He says, um, what's the second witness for 1844. Well, the first witness, of course I know. That's the 2300 days. Amen? Amen? And that can be found on this chart right here. From 457 B.C., 2300 days. As a Seventh-day Adventist, we believe that the 2300-day prophecy ended on October 22, 1844 that that was the day when Jesus entered into the most holy place. Amen? Amen? And so now here I am. I know this truth, and I'm starting to now be confused a little bit because is it that I can't remember, or was I never taught? And so I start, well, let's see... Uh, the 1290, and I already know the 1290 and the 1260 don't get you to 1844. They get you to 1798, prospectively. And so I'm going through my mind all these time prophecies, the 70 weeks, the 1260, the 1290, the 1335. I don't even know about. I don't even remember even going over the 1335 at this point. So... I'm going through my mind and I'm saying, well, well, I must know, I, I, I just must have forgot. And so then the individual asked me, well, what is the longest prophecy in the Bible? And I said, well, for sure it's the 2300 days, amen? And he goes, are you sure? And I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure. And then he says to me, have you ever heard of the 2520? And I said, 2520, should I have? <laughs> now I don't know. And, and, and I'm feeling a little bit uncomfortable because either, either there's a trickster that's trying to deceive me 
and lead me into some falsehood, or I don't know and have never been told, or I have forgotten, all of which make me uncomfortable. So at this time, they, they invite us to uh, spend more time with them, to uh, come over to their house for lunch, and um, I do a little research at this time, because I want to find out, what, what is he talking about? Did I miss something? Did I forget something? And uh, as, we, as I start studying, I realize that, yes, there is a second, second witness for 1844, but it was only taught up until a certain point within Adventism. And it's this 2520 time prophecy, the seven times of Leviticus, chapter 26. And as I started understanding the foundational teachings of Adventism, as I started going and studying for myself the precious truths that were laid at the foundation of our faith, I started realizing that I hadn't forgotten. I had never learned it. Because many, many years ago, as a people, we have stopped pushing or teaching our foundational doctrines. Now, there, God has always have a people that have stood for Him and His truth. And I have heard over the years that there have been many evangelists all through the years of Adventism that have taught off of these charts. But I myself have never studied them. And as I was challenged uh, to find a second witness for the 2300 days, it opened my eyes to want to study even deeper. And as I learned that this chart is not merely, uh, was not merely used as a instructional device for those that were preaching in the Millerite time period, but that it was ordained by God, that it is a prophecy of the Bible, and the spirit of prophecy says so, that, that these charts, both of them, fulfill a prophecy in the Bible, that of Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And so, as I understood that not only was the message that was given to the early Adventists um, right on target prophetically, but that the very charts themselves were ordained by God, that God specifically ordered this chart, that He was in this chart right here, that His hand was in this chart, and that the prophet of the Lord says that it is the prophecy of Habakkuk fulfilled. And as I started studying more deeply and realizing that it's not just the 2520 that had been laid down, but the original understanding of the daily in 508 and the understanding of the woes in Islam, that all these things have been laid aside. But the Bible says through Habakkuk, but at the end it will what? It will speak and not lie. And so when my mind became aware that these truths were a light that shines all the way to the end of time, that it is just as true and relevant today as it was in 1844, my mind became opened and I wanted to study even more deeply. And that is what happened to us when we were here, I started realizing that the whole reason that we were here was not necessarily just to move out of the city, but that we were going by the light that the Lord had given us. And we had to come all the way to Idaho to, to receive more light. Amen? Amen? Now, it's fascinating in this experience. This gentleman told us we were looking for a place to live, and he said to us, you know, if the Lord wants you to be here, you're only going to find out in the last hour. So we were here for 30 days, and we looked for a place to live, a, pr a place to... We couldn't even find a place to rent, okay? So the, the, the 29th day, I told my wife, I said, well, maybe the only reason the Lord brought us to Idaho was to uh, have a deeper understanding of the Bible and... Uh, I told my wife, we're going to leave at noon tomorrow. 
And if the Lord doesn't provide us with a place to live by noon tomorrow, then it wasn't his will for us to be here. And so she said, agreed. And I said, and then we'll leave Idaho and we'll go back home and we'll seek the Lord's counsel. Maybe he wanted us to come to Idaho for something else, for this other message, for the message. And so um, she said, well, before we leave tomorrow, there was a store that I wanted to check out before I left, before we left. And so I, I said, okay, so we'll pack up the vehicle, get the kids in, we'll hit this store on our way out of town, and then that's it. We're never coming back. And we said, I said to the, my wife, I said, and, and, if, and, and we're leaving, if, and we're going to test, the, we're going to put the Lord to the test, and if he doesn't provide us something with noon tomorrow, that's it. So we go to this store, and we're milling around in the store, and it's about 11.15, and the phone rings, my cell phone. And a lady is on the phone, and she goes, I understand that you're looking for a place to live. And I said, yeah, I, we are, but we're leaving at noon today. And unless you can show us the house, and we can rent it and take care of business and everything before we leave, then um, at noon, and we're leaving at noon, then uh, there's no sense in meeting or trying to meet or anything like that. And she goes, well, I can be there in 10 minutes. And I said, okay. So we got in the car and we drove over to the house. And she showed up and we made the deal and everything. And we were on the road by noon. And it literally happened in the very last hour that we were there. And so as we were driving back across the country, I told my wife, I said, um, do you really think that the Lord wants us to share this message? Uh, um, I, I just feel like, you know, we need to tell somebody about it. And she said to me, well, if the Lord wants you to share this message with other people, he'll provide a way. And minutes later, I got a call from a pastor back east, and he said that uh, he, he didn't have anybody to preach that week, and he had to go out of town unexpectedly. And uh, I popped into his mind for some reason, and I don't know why I would have, because I never preached there in the past. And I actually had an aversion to getting up in front of people and speaking. But he said that for some reason that I had uh, popped into his mind and he wanted to know if I wanted to preach that Sabbath. So 30 days after I had, we had received the foundational teachings, we're driving back home. I, you know, get, well, it's probably by this time it's like 32 days. And I had already acquired a set of these charts right here and by the time we got back home uh, it was it was going to be sabbath uh, the, the day after we got back and uh, i went to a church and set these two charts up and started preaching and my life has changed in, in a good way um, the lord has been convicted me of sin in my life and i've been confessing and um uh, studying the Word of God. Th this message has caused me to study the Word of God like nothing uh, I've ever experienced. And it has compelled me to go forth into uh, churches and into any kind of gathering at, where I can share um, my testimony and my belief of Jesus soon coming and in the first, second, and third angels' messages, which are illustrated on these two charts. And so um, any opportunity that I have at this point, uh, whether it be with a large group of people or with an individual, I feel compelled to share uh, this message, this truth, to warn God's people of His soon coming, that we need to be ready for when He comes. Amen? Amen. 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 Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for these truths, and I thank you, Lord, that you have um, given me a chance to come before you and confess my sins. And I pray, Lord, that you would pour out your Spirit on your people and have us ready for your soon coming and be ready for when the Sunday law comes, Lord, so that we can go with power to the world 
and share the message of warning is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father,